up, break it down, put it there, bring it on, step it up, right there, break it down, put it there, here we go, step it up, bring it on, let's go, uh. Hi, good afternoon everyone, nice that you're watching and welcome to this live and online lecture on synthetic biology engineering live. Today we have the honor to have genomics visionary Professor George Church live from the States in our program. Um, it's the opportunity for you, the audience, to ask him your questions on this fascinating subject. And you can ask your questions in the chat and we will do our best to address a couple of questions after the lecture today. Um, this lecture is organized by, the, by Studium Generale and the Institute for Complex Molecular Systems, ICMS, of the Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands. And this lecture is the third in a series on complexity science, organized by the focus area Grip on Complexity of the ICMS, an initiative of Emeritus Professor and former Rector Magnificus of TUE, Rutger van Zante, who is also working on a book on complexity science and complex societal challenges. And the book is expected to be published in early 2022. Uh, 2022, yeah. Uh, for a further introduction on today's topic, and our guest speaker of today, I would like to give the floor to Professor Jan van Hest. Uh, Jan van Hest is a professor of bioorganic chemistry at our university. He is the scientific director of ICMS. And nice to mention, last year he received the prestigious Spinoza Prize, the highest distinction in Dutch science. Um, hi, Jan, very welcome. Yes, you are there. Hi, guys. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks nice for the introduction. This, yeah, nice sure. to do this presentation together today um, and yeah. I'm looking forward to the to the lecture you as well I guess yeah well, I'm uh, really uh, highly interested to what uh, Professor Church has to tell us of course he will tell about uh, life and and how you can manipulate life and I think if you look at life it's probably one of the most complex systems that we know and uh, people have always been really fascinated Ja, dat was een foutje. Iemand heeft zijn microfoon uitgezet, dus moet even herstellen. Ja, ik 
Can I start? Okay, thanks, uh, Gijs. It was kind of a technical issue. I hope everyone can hear me now, both here in the Teams meeting and also via the YouTube channel. Just waiting until I, I don't hear any complaints anymore from my next-door neighbors. I think that's okay. So let, let me just uh, kind of start again with the, the introduction I gave, and that was about, of course, having Professor Church over here, which is a great pleasure. It works, thanks. I, I got the message, it's fine. Uh, it was a great pleasure for me to have Professor Church over here to speak about life and, in fact, uh, kind of synthetic biology. And probably life is one of the most complex systems that we know as mankind. And people have, over years, of, of years, have always thought about how life really has emerged. And, of course, also how all these molecular processes work uh, in a living system. And I think only in the past decades we have been really uh, reached out with the tools to make sure that we can understand on a molecular level how all these biological, biological processes operate. And I think that allows us now really not only to, uh, to look at living cells as they are, but also to see if we can move forward and see how we can modulate life and create advanced technologies with, with living cells. And furthermore, we can also do the reverse, going back to what, in fact, a minimal cell would, uh, would uh, look like to understand where life comes from. And if we want to look at what kind of tools we have been made available, I think it's very good to, to hear the story by one of the experts in this field, one of the pioneers, and that is Professor George Church. So just to say a little bit about uh, Professor George Church himself, he's a professor of genetics at uh, Harvard Medical School and also professor of health sciences and technology at Harvard and MIT. And he leads the synthetic biology activities at the Wies Institute, where he in fact oversees the directed evolution of whole genomes with a purpose to create tools in tissue engineering and bioproduction of chemicals. He has been a pioneer in the sequencing of genomes. In fact, he was the first one to sequence the whole, a whole organism in 1994. And therefore, of course, he has also he's been very instrumental to initiate the Human Genome Project. Over the years, he created many different tools from barcoding and multiplexing for the molecular and synthetic biologists to analyze where and when genes are expressed in cells. Um, but he's also active in making it possible to recombine and reconstruct genes in an effective way. He currently, currently explores his technology uh, to modulate cells for stem cell engineering and transplantation technology, and has a great interest uh, to uh, explore this technology in brain tissue development. More and more, this is done with the aid of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And besides his interest in forward bioengineering, creating life with advanced features, he has also made similar contributions to the field that is known as, as minimal cell research, uh, where he's looking at living cells with a minimal genome. George is a member of both the National Academy of Sciences and Engineering and also the founder of a range of companies in the field of synthetic biology. And he's a real visionary leader in the field of this, this uh, the domain. And he has inspired many uh, generations of researchers, being a true ambassador for his science and a hero for many. And we're really looking forward to his talk, which is called Engineering Perplexity for Yoctogram to Exagram. And I think it's great to have this exciting title. And I really like, well, really looking forward to his uh, talk. So, George, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Can, can everyone on the YouTube see a single slide now uh, and uh, hear me? Um, Single slide and hear me, anybody? Bye. Okay, so uh, we've heard that the, the title is on reflexity and uh, various scales, um, and uh, my conflict of interest is, is there listed at the bottom. Um, this, uh, this idea of replicated complexity or reflexity, uh, I introduced in my book in 2012, 2014 versions, and the idea is that um, as complexity increases from, from very simple um, structures like crystals on the far left to completely random material on the far right with the number of bits, essentially, uh, the, or the length of the polymers or the, or the number of atoms going up to 10 to the 24th on the, on the right, um, the replicated part of that goes up slowly, logarithmically, because you'll just, at random, in a, in a random polymer, you will find some repeats. 
but you won't find very long repeats. So, so in a polymer, in a polymer or a collection of atoms on the order of 10 to the 24th, you'll find hundreds of perfect repeats of hundreds long. Um, but if you go into living systems, um, for example, that go from inorganic material to complex uh, systems like uh, these cyanobacteria in the upper right, um, you you put you have roughly the uh, same replexity as complexity, the same replicated complexity as you have complexity, which is uh, the notice the change in the y-axis here, um, going up logarithmically, but then taking a big uh, jump to uh, 10 to the 24th. And this is true for almost all living systems, from the minimal to the to the entire ecosystem. Now, for synthetic biology, uh, as we're talking about uh, yoctogram to exogram from 10 to the minus 24th grams, which is one proton, to 10 to the 18th grams, which is the order of the number of gigatons of carbon, which we think are at risk um, in, um, in the Arctic and peat bogs and so forth, uh, where they could turn into methane or CO2, methane being about 30 times worse than CO2 in terms of warming. Uh, we're going to start by looking at the at the at left hand side where we're we're manipulating one, essentially one proton, as you'll see in a moment. And we want I want to talk about all these uh, component these technological components that are required for um, small and large scale engineering, ranging from being able to read and write uh, genomes to accelerated developmental biology as a kind of kind of three D printing of sorts, um, and then multiomics, looking at many different kinds of transcriptome, proteome, and so forth. Now, the reason that, that, that we can synthesize this level of complexity, not just study it, not just analyze it, but synthesize it, uh, we have these two curves, the, the analytic uh, curve in red and the synthetic curve in blue, and they both underwent a faster than Moore's law uh, change in around 2004. Uh, not so much because of automation or parallelism, but due to multiplexing. This is uh, having multiple uh, um, molecules that are barcoded that have their identifiers, so they can be mixed, and you can process millions or trillions of molecules or cells as if they were one. So the cost is roughly the same as one, or uh, you know, uh, in practice about 60 million times cheaper. And this most of this happened in the last uh, decade or so. So multiplexing kicking in around 2005 or so. And the, and the poor, we had a poor quality $3 billion genome uh, around 2004. We now have very high clinical grade genomes for about $300 and coming down to 100. So what do we mean by this single proton, this yoctogram change? So when we change a nitrogen to an oxygen or an NH2 to a to a keto group on a on a on an A, it changes it to something that looks like a G and base pairs like a G. So that 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 one proton equivalent, that one atomic mass unit, has a huge uh, change in the functionality of an A as it changes changes to an I or a G, and and we've applied that change, that a so-called deamination, where a nitrogen changes to an oxygen via water and an enzyme, a deaminase enzyme, we've applied this to m various repeat categories. This is sort of the dark matter or the unmentionable part of the genome, which until really the last few weeks was not sequenced in the human genome. The human genome had not been sequenced uh, until the last uh, few weeks. And uh, and so now all these, these parts that, that were um, confusing are now up for not just reading, but now uh, editing. And so we have edited all of the endogenous retroviruses in one organism, and we have edited almost all of the line elements, which is a much larger family of repeats in the human genome, as you'll see in a moment. And we're doing these repeats not just because they're, they're suddenly accessible to reading, but also because they are in, they've been shown to be involved in senescence, neurogenesis, cancer, inflammation, from these and many other articles, um, not not from our group. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to show you uh, later the endogenous retroviruses and right now the the line elements. So the line elements uh, we're looking at about uh, 22,000 of these line elements, um, which have properties that that are reminiscent of uh, 
retrotransposons, retro, uh, retroviruses, and uh, then they hop around in, in the inside of the genome of all mammals, including humans, during developmental biology. And so we targeted these with deaminating a C, uh, the nitrogen to an oxygen to a T, and an A to a G. Um, and this is work from uh, our lab and from David Liu's lab. We particularly, uh, we've found that even the, the tiny amount of mutagenesis or the covalent change in the complex uh, genome that comes from just changing that one atom, but at multiple locations in the genome can be quite toxic, I mean, lethal, lethal to the cell. Um, and so we have to do all these five things here to minimize that lethality of changing thousands of sites simultaneously in a cell. There can be no source of nicking whatsoever. Some of that nicking comes from mismatch repair or MMR, or it comes from a particular kind of repair process where a C changes to a U to a T, and, and while it's a U, it's, it's subject to repair that can result in nicks. Uh, the nicks can turn into double strand breaks. And then we have two um, uh, anti-apoptotic factors and growth factors, which we have found useful in making engineering the germline uh, of mammals, as you'll see in a moment. This is work from Corey, Oscar, Khalid, and Verena in our group and published in nucleic acids research recently. And here is some of the data from the, uh, from the record, which is over 22,000 edits in a single human induced pluripotent stem cells. So these are, these are cells that can produce any other kind of cell by differentiation and, um, and we don't need to go through the detail, but sufficient to say that we can get a single clone, which is stable um, to, through replication cycles that contains these 22,000 edits of A's into G's at the sites that I showed in the previous slide. Um, now, that's a special case where you have one um, editing protein, a CRISPR plus guide RNA um, plus um, deaminase. Um, that one uh, targeting is targeting multiple sites throughout the genome. So essentially one enzyme, which is an RNA protein complex, targets multiple places. We'd also like to be able to have multiple enzymes targeting multiple places. Um, and we do this by having uh, multiple guide RNAs. I'm sorry, I'm skipping over uh, all the CRISPR basics. Uh, I'm assuming that either you you know it already or you're not particularly interested in knowing it. Um, and so uh, I'm assuming uh, the appropriate level of knowledge about CRISPR. And the idea is, um, and we use other kinds of editors as well, uh, but the idea is the guide RNAs guide the enzyme to any place in the genome um, based on the the computer design of um, a particular s uh, sequence of about 20 base pairs, which is either intentionally repeated in the genome or intentionally unique in the genome. Um, and we've done up to 50 of these at once and, and found up to 33 edits at once with 33 different guide RNAs. Again, we have done up to 22,000 simultaneously with one guy around aimed at a repeat. So our success so far is uh, mostly with the repeats, ironically, which was the, the hard, was considered the hard part of the genome and now is becoming the easy part to edit. So I'm gonna give a few uh, scenarios where we're making, we're doing very complex editing. So this fits in with the complexity theme that we've been talking about, where we're, do, we're doing multiplex editing of multiple uh, sites in the genome and, and, and justification for these. So one of these is we're, we're, we're trying to make a synthetic biology version of an elephant, which is capable of um, restoring the grasslands of the Arctic, Canada, United States, and Russia, um, because there's uh, 1,400 gigatons, this is the exagram of carbon, um, which could be released as, as methane or, or carbon dioxide from the thawing uh, ice of the Arctic. Um, so we want to slow that down by, by three methods, uh, three related phenomenon, which is the, uh, in going from, from grass versus trees. So we went from grass about uh, 20,000 years ago to 
to, to uh, an abundance of trees, and now we're going back. And that results in a change in albedo, the reflectance of the, of the light. So the more you reflect, the, the less warmth goes into the, the soil. The photosynthetic rate of grass is much better. And the trees prevent snow packing. They basically allow a, a downy insulating layer to form um, where the, the herbivores, which we mostly uh, removed and now are replacing in the Arctic, um, they can they can pack the snow, but only if it's grass, not if it's a tree. So anyway, it, looking at this ecosystem uh, to restore it to a previous form that we think is more compatible um, it, uh, with our, our current ecological um, needs, um, we are, we're looking for ways to do that conversion of trees back to grass. And all the herbivores are good at maintaining the grass um, until we killed them off, um, but, but they were not good at restoring that. And, and, and the unique herbivore that is capable of restoring trees to grass is probably the elephant or the woolly mammoth uh, being more adapted for the cold. Um, the elephants like to knock over uh, trees and are quite, quite good at it. Um, so this is, uh, we have uh, collaboration, um, uh, San Francisco, Boston, and, and Chersky in uh, Northern Siberia here. This is um, in, at the edge of the Arctic uh, oceans. Uh, there is a Pleistocene park, which is somewhere between uh, 16 square kilometers of active research uh, park um, to more than 100 square kilometers that is in transition. And it has all, uh, Nikita and Sergei Zimov have, are the um, you know, founding scientists and directors. Um, it has about nine different uh, restored um, Arctic adapted mammals. Um, and, uh, and here is the methane in the lakes uh, being uh, shown as uh, 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 explosive uh, or, or just leaking out is, is adequate. Converting it from methane to carbon dioxide as happens when it's uh, um, ignited is probably a good thing by about a factor of 30. So some of the methane uh, uh, spontaneously blasts, and these blast holes are found from the air because uh, there's the population density is so low, but most of the methane leaks without uh, exploding. Um, here are some of the progress that we made on um, genome changes. We think it's maybe in the range of 40 to 100 genomic changes. I already mentioned that we can do 22,000 under some circumstances, but the sort of things that we're looking for in the first 40 to 100 is cold tolerance, which is already, there's already two genes involved in cold tolerance that have been re restored from ancient DNA. This is DNA that's been read out from um, uh, 10 to 40,000 year old um, specimens, read into the computer, read from the computer into synthetic DNA, and into synthetic DNA into uh, um, mammalian cells, um, and then shown to, to confer cold tolerance physiology in, in uh, assays. So this has been true for the hemoglobin in blood, shown here the hemoglobin tree, family tree, uh, phylogeny uh, of Asian elephant being closer to the woolly mammoth, not just in the hemoglobin gene, but in essentially all the genetic, uh, closer to each other than, uh, than to African elephant. Um, and uh, anyway, the hemoglobin gene has been brought back and a, a neuronal uh, gene, uh, TRIP-V3, has also been brought back and tested, and they look uh, quite promising. And we're, we're now moving on to, to the small ear size, very small compared to the African elephant, the woolly hair, um, extensive woolly hair and 10 centimeter fat deposits. We're also, so those, those are essentially de-extinction or re restoration. Re um, then there are other things that are new, like uh, resistance to the herpes virus, EEHV, which is nearly uh, an existential risk, uh, uh, an extinction risk uh, um, in elephants, about 25% of baby elephants at weaning um, succumb, die uh, to EEHV. Uh, the tusk size varies in naturally occurring elephants, and this is a 
strong predictor of poaching. So to make poaching resistant elephants, we would like the tusks to be um, uh, either small or, or contro controllably large or small, depending on um, a diet or, or whether, you know, whether they're protected or not. So these are, so you can think of this more as a synthetic biology project than a de-extinction of a species. We're trying to preserve an uh, endangered species with the Asian elephant by making small adaptations to, uh, to, to cold, to viruses and to poachers. Um, we have de-risked and, and shown various advantages of germline versus somatic modification. We, we prefer germline for uh, animal, um, uh, for many a animal applications. I'll show you in a moment some that we've done on, on pigs that show this advantage of germline in animals. It's a billion fold lower off target because we're targeting just one cell, the egg, um, it is, or one cell that goes into the egg. Um, it is clonal, which allows us to check. That is something that's very hard to do when we do, say, somatic gene therapy, where many different cells are independently edited and not, and it's, you can't check them all. The immune tolerance is nearly perfect because you, your immune tolerance is, uh, happens as you were uh, born and, and, uh, and soon thereafter. You get 100% delivery to every single cell in the body. This is a consequence of the germline delivery. And, it, and once you have it established as a breeding population, then it is essentially free uh, for all subsequent generations. Assuming you had the wherewithal to, to feed subsequent generations, the rest of it, all the technology is free. Um, disadvantages, it can take a while to, to see all the consequences. Um, and they're, in the case of humans, which is not what we're doing germline on, uh, there are very few uh, newborns. Now, for somatic, uh, and, and to illustrate this engineering of complex uh, mammalian systems, uh, we're looking at uh, transplants. And the first uh, working transplants, although they were tried many years earlier, the first working one was in an identical twin in 1954 at one of the Harvard Associated Hospitals. Um, and ever since then, even with immunosuppression, you still have to have very good uh, matching of tissue types. And uh, for the first time now, we have um, cell therapies and, and uh, tissue therapies where we don't have to have matching. And that is because uh, for, for using these um, uh, chimeric antigen receptor T cells, these are, these are T cells that have been engineered to fight out B cell malignancies in the blood. Um, you want them to not be rejected. You want the T cells to neither attack the host nor have the host attack it. And so um, we do this multiplex editing, modest levels of editing, you know, two or three genes it's chosen from here, five different genes, knocking out the T cell extra T cell receptor components, knocking out the major histocompatibility antigens and so forth. And this can be done by three different editing systems, uh, <clears throat> zinc fingers, talons, and CRISPR. And all that's critical here to know is that, that they are, that you can engineer the, the enzymes via computer to target specific parts of the genome and knock them out. They're very good at knocking out, a little bit harder to get precise edits, although I've been showing you precise edits so far. So what we've done, so our record now Remember, our record for human stem cells in culture, so at the cellular level, is 22,000. At the animal level, where we have germline editing in healthy herds of small herds of pigs, um, is 42. We've changed 42, made 42 genetic uh, modifications, and these uh, are because of incompatibility between pigs and humans, both because of the sugars on the surface of their cells the blood clotting factors, the, and various immune functions. Uh, all uh, the, the wish lists of many labs over the last two decades have been collected, and, we, and we've now implemented all of them in, these, uh, in this series of these three papers. Um, uh, and these have also been implemented in two companies, one in uh, China and one in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Jim Markman is, is heading the the uh, surgical team that's doing preclinical trials at Massachusetts General Hospital. And we have 100 day survival of these organs in um, non human primates.
uh, I should mention that Lu Han Yang um, was involved in all of this work, uh, both graduate student, postdoctoral fellow, and now uh, CEO. Um, uh, and uh, and was also co-inventor of CRISPR. And the point of this is not just to deal with the um, crisis that we have with an insufficient number of organ donors, but the opportunity to make uh, organs that are uh, enhanced better than the typical human donor organ in that they can be resistant to pathogens, to cancer, to senescence, immunity, I've already mentioned, uh, maybe uh, cryopreservation and DNA damage. All of these uh, will improve their, their, their viability. And most, and essentially all of these have been proven either in naturally occurring animals, such as the tardigrade, or in um, synthetic biology animals uh, like uh, the mouse. Um, we're doing epigenetics, which means uh, following development from eggs and sperm. We can even use developmental biology to make eggs and sperm uh, in vitro outside of the body of an animal. Um, and we're moving towards, uh, and, and of course, for all categories of mammals, uh, uh, sorry, of vertebrates, uh, fish, amphibia, reptiles, uh, birds, and, and mammals, there are examples that, that where the developmental biology occurs outside of the body. In, in, in the egg, um, and we're trying to get that to work for mammals in general um, via vascularized endometrium, which is where the embryo implants. Now, each of these steps of uh, epigenetics is checked by looking at the DNA, RNA, and protein at ideally at super resolution here, sort of 15 to 20 nanometer resolution. So conventional microscopy limited to around 300 nanometers. And a lot of the DNA work has been spearheaded by Ting Wu, who's a professor of genetics at Harvard. Um, and uh, that's that's DNA. This is RNA, where each dot is a single RNA molecule, um, where the, the, the sequence of change in color, not position, and then they can be uh, redisplayed where the, the series of colors that happened over a series of chemical uh, probing cycles, fluorescent probing cycles can be displayed and you get a barcode, a sequence barcode for each RNA or DNA or protein. So these little tags, whether they're natural or, or synthetic barcodes can be read out and you can know for each pixel or each voxel in an image uh, at super resolution or at normal resolution, what, what is the barcode of the DNA, RNA, protein at that, at that point. So here's the, the last of, you know, uh, of the three types, DNA, RNA, protein, where an, uh, antibodies or nanobodies can be tagged with very short oligonucleotides, as little as nine bases long. And this allows us to go from this poor normal microscopy to super resolution, where we can now detect all the synaptic proteins, which were previously all blurred and together. And we can tell the direction that the synapse goes from pre to postsynaptic and whether they're excitatory or inhibitory. So, um, and we're using this as part of a, a connectome of figuring out the, the connections and activity of the brain. Now, all of this super resolution is done with, uh, mostly with these two instruments, one of which is at 10X uh, Read Core, and the other is at Booker Hutara. Um, these are uh, ironically less expensive than a conventional next-gen sequencing, although they're very similar to next-gen sequencing and in, in that they're all based on microscopy of slides, you know, of uh, uh, sequencing on slides. Uh, however, the, the, the uh, three-dimensional imaging uh, allows thousand times thicker samples, uh, which is much more informative and uh, possibly cost-effective. Now, using this kind of information on epigenetics of reading uh, the complex um, three-dimensional, four-dimensional structure of, um, of living systems, um, we can classify cells into the various cell types. We don't know how many there are right now. There are hundreds of different cell types, but we're building up atlases or landscapes uh, uh, where we do cluster analysis and find which ones are uh, each of the different cell types. Um, as we build up these um, analytic data, we also turn them into recipes, which allow us to, to make those cells from stem cells. 
So we want to not only read out where they are and what they are in terms of RNA and protein, but we want to know how to make them from, from um, pluripotent stem cells. So these recipes are kind of the writing aspect of the reading of atlases. Um, and uh, the, the, we are getting to the point where almost all the stages of mammalian development can be uh, done outside of a mammalian uh, um, uh, maternal uterine environment. Um, here, here is, for example, a, a lamb being um, uh, cared for uh, in uh, all the way to term, to birth, uh, to live birth. Um, but it also can be done at the implantation stage. Here you see a, an embryo implanting into, uh, into the endometrium, um, uh, which can be done both uh, in, in, vi in vivo, but we're also, um, our project is to have, to have to have this happen in vitro using in, di in vitro differentiated cells producing the gametes uh, that get fertilized as well as the endometrium into which they implant and the endothelium, uh, which provides the blood. Here's an example of some of that endothelium uh, you know, here, um, the, the characteristic antibody staining of endothelial proteins, VE cadherin, uh, can be seen nicely interspersed with all the other cell types uh, um, of a tissue. This is done in collaboration with Jennifer Lewis's lab. So we have in endothelium, uh, we have a multi, multicellular integration. Here's an example of two cell types. Uh, neurons and, and the ligodendrocytes making myelin, and that and that and those multicellular complexes, when put into a, uh, an animal with a neurodegenerative disease, uh, can rescue the the disease by replacing the cells that are damaged, and they can be replaced in such a way that that the incoming cells are resistant to the the um, immune dysfunction that resulted in. Uh, this uh, model for multiple sclerosis. So these are now moving uh, toward uh, preclinical trials um, at GC Therapeutics. Uh, Alex and Paris do have spearheaded, uh, have spearheaded this. So I just want to conclude by giving, uh, summarizing some examples that have shown where we have to do, where we have to do complex multiplex editing um, the elephant, uh, we think there's somewhere between 40 and 100 uh, changes that we're making them to be cold resistant, virus resistant, poacher resistant. For uh, um, the pig, we've made uh, somewhere between uh, 20 and 62 different edits to allow transplants. Um, for the human, we've done 22,000 edits in repetitive elements. Um, and we're working on various ways of getting multivirus resistance by recoding. I didn't show that, um, but we've done we've successfully done that for at least one cell type. Um, I mentioned that we can, we think we can make um, transplants which are uh, resistant to senescence, and we've demonstrated this in the form of uh, mouse and now dog uh, gene therapies, where three genes uh, uh, can in concert. Um, uh, fix many of the nine pathways of aging and attack somewhere between four and seven, seven now, now different diseases that have very little in common other than that they are uh, age related. In fact, almost all morbidity and mortality has some aging component. COVID-19 has an aging component. Falling down and not getting up does as well. And Pedro de Magalas was a postdoc in my lab who has a wonderful uh, aging database. Uh, maintained in his lab in, in Liverpool. So I'm just going to uh, open it up for questions there. This is uh, the, the opening slide and the final slide where we've gone from uh, yoctogram, which is one proton, to sort of the scale of thinking of uh, 1,400 gigatons, which is the amount of carbon that's at risk, not due to human activity, which is only 10 gigatons um, per year, but uh, due to uh, human in inactivity uh, in preventing a positive feedback loop. Um, I mentioned some of these people along the way uh, in, in the slides that have uh, contributed. Um, there's been a great deal of help in engineering uh, these complex systems. 
Uh, period, full stop. Thank you. Questions? Well, Professor Church, thank you very much for giving your talk today and uh, sharing all your insights, insights of the work you are doing with us. That's very nice to see. Um, Jan, maybe to start yeah. off, maybe you have a first question. Yeah, well, well, thanks, uh, George, for this uh, highly intriguing lecture. And I guess we've, you know, you show that, I mean, there's an entire new future ahead of us, it seems like. We can really kind of engineer life the way we want to like to have it. And I think there seems to be no limit to, to what we can do technologically. Could you say something about that? So what, what, are, the, what are the limitations we still facing to, to make sure that we really can combat diseases by just say, say genomic editing? Um, well, most of the limits are, are uh, set either biology or physics. Uh, there are many things that we can do with physics that we can't do with biology. So for example, it's very difficult to engineer our biology so that we can go, say travel into space. Uh, not impossible, but challenging to do it purely biologically. Uh, similarly, with physics, there are limitations currently uh, in that it, it's very hard to, uh, with pure uh, physics and chemistry, to um, uh, you know, improve immune function, uh, to fight cognitive decline and, and uh, aging. Um, you know, I, I, I think that uh, the number of edits we can make is still limited. There's off targets. Uh, there are, um, um, it's hard to test things in the germline uh, thoroughly um, if they have long-term effect. And, and hence there's no germline uh, editing in humans. Although most of the things that we need to do in human can be done by either germline manipulating of animals to donate cells to, or organs to humans, or we can do it by somatic gene therapy. Yeah. Um, I mean, and there are cost limitations. There, there, there are plenty of uh, yeah. challenges left. But, but if, you, if you have say 22,000 edits, I think that's an amazing figure. So how do you know for sure that uh, these edits don't affect each other in, a, in an unexpected way? I mean, how do you know all the pathways that are affected by these kinds of edits? Uh, well, I, this is uh, bioengineering, like engineering in general, is a trial and error process. It has some theory, but, but, the, but the very best technologies uh, have a great deal of trial and error. And, and in this case, um, we're look. We look. At, we're aiming for a function. But the goal is not necessarily a particular getting there by a particular mechanism or getting there by a, a fixed number of mutations. We can have a few extra mutations um, as long as they don't affect functionality. Um, we can tolerate them. We can sequence the entire genome, especially if you're going through a clone or through germline, and make sure it is acceptable. Uh, we can either sequence it or we can do a functional analysis. Um, yeah. So I think that's the that's the bottom line. And each each year we get better and better at, at uh, efficiency and um, reducing off target effects and and generally uh, doing systems analysis. Many of the breakthroughs in in um, in biology did not require complete understanding, which is part of your question. Yeah. Uh, we can we can manipulate complex systems. Yeah without understanding them. My, the classic example is smallpox vaccine. We started doing that in the 1500s, really ramp, ramped it up in the 1700s. And uh, we had no idea what virology or immunology was during most of that campaign. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. yeah. So I was also really kind of fascinated by your story about the elephant. You want to turn this into a, a mammoth, I guess, uh, just to make sure it can kind of take care of, of the trees and then making sure grass is growing. So would you say that it's better for the climate on Earth to really remove the entire, say, uh, Arctic uh, forest and replace it with, with grasslands that are then kind of taken care of by these herbivores, these, these uh, mammoths? It sounds a little bit like going to Jurassic Park, isn't it? Well, Jurassic Park was uh, contained. Uh, th yeah. This is this is uh, in a way scarier because it's not yeah. contained, yeah. but it's less scary because there are herbivores and there and it's in an area that's uh, uninhabited. Yeah. Uh, we have some experience with um, large herbivores. If they get out of control, we can 
control them. This has happened in the Galapagos in Ecuador, um, where the goats were introduced accidentally, and they uh, became a threat to other uh, more native species like the the eggs of the of the large tortoises, yeah. and so uh, the government um, uh, took a, a, a exterminated the goats uh, successfully, um, or they're in the process of it. So, um, you know, I think the same thing in uh, in in the Arctic. The idea is not to remove a species; it's really to to shift. Uh, and restore a, a balance uh, that, that, that was altered partly through human interference, you know, thousands of years ago, um, to shift it back. So there'll, there'll still be trees and, and grasses, there'll just be a different ratio, um, much much more like the ancestral ratio. Yeah. But, yeah. Then, but then could you also uh, elaborate a bit more on the risks you take uh, on the level, on the molecular level, as well as on the level of the organism itself or even the population of species. Right, so at the molecular level, we can characterize the genome and the epigenome pretty uh, thoroughly using the methods that I described, including the microscopy methods. Um, and if they're clonal, we can decide, you know, what level of precision we want and we can just keep going until we get it. Um, at the functional level and at the ecological level, that is that requires testing. <clears throat> All of this requires testing, where you see how it plays out. And uh, if it doesn't, if it doesn't work, then you get back to the drawing board, um, as with any engineering uh, discipline. Uh, I think working with very large herbivores is, in a certain sense, easier than say working with bacteria or fungi or mosquitoes or something like that, which are much. If if, if you make a mistake there it's much harder to pull the genie back into the bottle because they're so small and they're, and they're so proliferative. So uh, nevertheless, we do a lot of engineering of small things, like, for example, almost all the insulin used in the world today is made in bacteria. So it's human insulin gene working in bacteria. So uh, the, those are not grown in the wild, but they could escape into the wild. But, you know, generally speaking, things can be biocontained either natu naturally or uh, by synthetic biology. Yeah. yeah. And th this could be um, ways to solve uh, societal uh, challenges uh, on, on uh, environmental problems or uh, in uh, ways of climate change. But I was wondering what uh, drives you personally to, to push or even to break uh, the boundaries of nature in this way? Well, humans are part of nature, and uh, we've been engineering nature for for uh, pr since prehistoric era. Um, so it's not really breaking uh, nature; we're we're uh, part of it. Um, and to some extent, uh, once uh, we're the only species that really has the the potential for preserving nature as we know it. If if something catastrophic were to hit. Uh, Earth, like an asteroid, uh, maybe an asteroid worse than the asteroid that caused the major extinction uh, of the dinosaurs. Uh, we're the, one of the few species that could take an ark with us and go establish a colony somewhere else on another planet um, or reestablish it on Earth because we can engineer and think ahead. I mean, I, that we, we want to avoid hubris and, and arrogance and, and thinking that we know everything, but through trial and error, uh, if we give ourselves enough options, I think uh, um, diversity is, uh, is our is, is uh, our friend, and uh, we just need to decide which diversity where. Yeah. Okay. So uh, oh. Yeah, uh, there there are also some questions in the chat. So. Um, Shall we yeah. go to the questions? In yeah, the please go ahead, guys. Uh, okay. I still have a number of questions myself, but yeah, of course, it's good to hear what questions are on the chat. Yeah. yeah. Okay, there's uh, one about uh, aging and uh, telomere restoration. Um, and the question is, um, I, I read that a possible reason of the aging of animals is the shortening of telomeres. In what time frame do you think it is possible, possible to make a gene that produces proteins that restore telomeres, and 
maybe in general, what are your thoughts about it, about this topic in general? So the, the, the example that I gave, which was published in PNAS, was three genes that, that affect um, the nine different pathways of aging. So one of the pathways is telomere function, but there are other ones uh, having to do with mitochondrial function, with uh, monitoring of uh, senescent cell synolytic uh, processes and so forth. So there's nine different pathways. Telomeres is one of them. Uh, we, they, we've shown uh, in animals that just doing telomeres and not the other eight pathways can have a positive impact. Um, and many of these pathways interact. So if you get all the other eight pathways right, then the telomeres c comes along for the ride. They, 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 they uh, intertwine with one another. Um, the, the problem with delivering the telomerase protein, the, the, the enzymes that maintain the telomere directly, is that they have to be delivered to every cell that is proliferative, that's that where you're replicating the ends of the chromosomes, the telomeres. Um, while the method that we use, you can get a subset of the cells and then they distribute hormones and, and soluble factors to other cells nearby and throughout the body. And so that allows you to amplify um, a less than perfectly efficient um, delivery mechanism. So for the time being, we're influencing telomeres indirectly through the rest of the aging system um, until we get much better delivery. Good question. Thanks. OK. So yeah, go ahead, John. Yes, yeah, George, would it also mean that at a certain moment we, we can become immortal if you really can control all these processes or you think you need to do much more to I, make I sure think that... I, I, I avoid the term uh, longevity, which is yeah. a weaker term than immortality. Immortality uh, just seems improbable. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Because at least 10 to the 100th years from now, there's going to be something big that happens in the universe <laughs> yeah. cooling down. But... Yeah. Uh, but even longevity is a problematic term because it, if you want to go to the FDA or the EMA in Europe or, or uh, around the world, um, they're going to want to see a clinical trial that is consistent with the claims that you want to make for your product. So yeah. uh, if you're going to claim to extend human life, it has to be beyond the noise level of the variation between, say, your longevity and mine. And so that means you're talking about 30-year clinical trial, which is... Uh, economically disastrous. Yeah. Um, but if you do aging reversal, some signs of aging reversal occur in weeks. And so it's much more like a normal drug in that regard. And so uh, you can get very rapid feedback and keep your clinical trials short. I mean, we set a record for clinical trials recently with the, the, the gene therapy based uh, COVID-19 vaccines of 10 months. Yeah. Uh, normally it takes longer than that, but, but it, that's the sort of range that we would like to be able to be do uh, therapeutic trials in general and, and longevity and immortality are just not on that uh, time frame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's but question. it is possible if you have aging reversal, you may have achieved longevity, you just won't know it for, yeah, yeah, for exactly. many decades. Yeah. 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 Uh, there's a question in the chat that's a bit in line with this, uh, what we are discussing. Uh, about immortality and gene therapy. Um, have your timeline for xenotransplantation and gene therapy changed in the past two or three, three years? So uh, the xenotransplantation is uh, very close to human clinical trials now. The, the, the uh, primate uh, preclinical trials are, um, you know, it, um, in the 100-day area. Uh, I mean, it's reproducibly producing 100-day survival of the, of the transplants. Um, and so, 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 that, so we're, you know, within a few years of, of doing human clinical trials, um, and that means a few more years to get them done, get complete the human clinical trials. Um, uh, same thing is true for many of the gene therapy and editing trials. So, so all those cell therapies, transplants, and gene editing are all in clinical trials. Some have actually been approved. Um, it's it's moving very quickly, just as as uh, next generation sequencing uh, was moving exponentially. Okay, thank you. Um... 
the next question is uh, also related to gene therapy. Um, elephants seem to have 20 copies of the P53 gene, which lowers the probability that they acquire tumors. Do you think it is possible such an approach would work with humans, which only have a single copy of the P53 gene? That's a, uh, maybe a question for the specialists. Yes. So, so uh, I can make it a little less specialized and still answer yeah. it at a, at a detailed level. Uh, so tumor suppressor genes in general, including P53, have been shown that when you uh, make extra copies, um, if they're properly regulated, they protect against loss of a copy. I mean, it, it, it is definitely true that two copies are better than one, um, and uh, three and four copies might be better still. Uh, the elephant is a special case in that the P53s are not normal P53s, so so it's it's not really fully understood what the extra copies are doing. It, it is not as a simple case that they are uh, simply extra copies of P53. But I think the, the strategy of, of making extra copies, making sure that the regulation uh, takes into account, you don't want to have too much P53, um, but if you have something that's kind of lurking in the background, waiting if some of the copies get damaged to take over, then that would be uh, probably very advantageous. But it's only part of a, of a bigger strategy for preventing senescence and, and uh, oncogenesis. Okay. Uh, <laughs> George, uh, yeah, maybe I still have a question about when you started off your lecture. So you mentioned uh, that the development of multiplexing really overtook the, the speed of the Moore's law that you normally see in microelectronics. Um, of course, DNA is an information carrying system. So, uh, how is it possible? Is it possible to really start computing with DNA in a way? It can also overtake our traditional way of, of kind of uh, microelectronic computing that we're now using uh, at the moment. Well, compute. I think a hybrid system is pro is is quite likely. Uh, in a certain sense, we already have a hybrid system here, here at my you know, cell phone. Is uh, includes all of human knowledge uh, access yeah. to it. Uh, but uh, the computers tend to be uh, can do elementary operations that are quite quick. Uh, good at information uh, retrieval and and math, um, but biological systems are uh, low energy consumption, which is good, uh, maybe a thousand to a million times lower energy consumption than uh, other uh, storage and retrieval devices. DNA uh, storage has been has now been uh, pursued by a number of large and small companies. Um, and it's about a million times more compact. It, longevity, the, the record for longevity of DNA storage is on the order of uh, uh, 1.2 million years. So there's, there, I, th I think we, uh, and we, 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 our lab has published on storing a, a, a trillion bytes of information in a, in a animal uh, that just in a very tiny fraction, a billionth of the animal's um, mass. So, um, I think it's something to, to keep our eye on is these hybrid systems where uh, you have the advantages of, of each. Yeah. And also maybe on that line, I mean, the incorporation of machine learning in, into what you're doing, would that at a certain moment lead to a way how you could make hybrid systems that kind of automatically kind of added their genome based on the conditions in which certain hybrid organisms are, are living? Or is it just too much in looking into the future? Um, uh, could, could you repeat the beginning of that? Uh, uh, I, I guess you know, I, I think yeah, but the, the computational power becomes more and more uh, kind of uh, present, I think. And of course, it's also more important to make sure that you can deal with large numbers of data and that you can also learn from the data generated, so that's oh, uh, machine, machine learning. learning, right, yeah. So if so you could kind of integrate that seamlessly with gene editing, right. would that lead to an autonomously developing organism? Um, that's a ways off, but but machine learning has taken a rapid step forward, uh, especially integrating it with uh, protein design. We've just published four papers on, on um, 
integrating uh, the synthesis of large libraries, millions of different protein or viral capsid or cellular designs, synthesized, not randomized, but synthesized to specs, uh, and then doing loops of machine learning and design. So uh, it's getting closer to what you're talking about. Uh, um, and it just a giant leap forward. It's now, we, we can now, instead of making four changes to a protein and breaking it, we can take 29 changes to the protein and have a new functionality emerge. So I think um, I would definitely pay attention. That's another exponential that's likely to be developing soon. Nice. Good question. And, and what's, your, what, what's the term you use for a uh, human being, being that is modified in this way? Because uh, a cyborg, that's a fusion of uh, a man and machine, but the fusion of uh, or the the modification of humans in this way, creating maybe even a new well, species. Well, I think for now that we for the now we call them gene therapies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but that's a very <laughs> very practical uh, and positive. But, but yeah, there there'll be a whole series of of new terminologies. Mm -hmm. I unfortunately have to go to a, another meeting now, but it's yeah, been great. It's, 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 it's been five great. I'd be happy to follow up with anyone that, that has additional questions. Uh, yeah, that's perfect. And uh, uh, well, we would like to thank you very much uh, for being with us today, and uh, as we said, sharing your thoughts with us on this on this also fascinating and and complex topic. Yes. Um, so it was a great honor to have you in the program today. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, I've enjoyed it and hope to follow up. Yeah, thanks, George, for Bye. giving us food for thought. Yeah, and for everyone in the audience, uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, for the bachelor students who would like to register for their uh, use and SG credits, uh, a link to the online registration form will appear in uh, the chat in a few seconds. And, um, well, Jan, uh, you also thank you very much for co-hosting this program with me today. Um, well. Uh, this lecture series uh, is also always followed by uh, a complex Friday seminar. Um, so the next one is the upcoming Friday, uh, June 18, starting at 2 p.m. Um, it's an online meeting, and uh, a link to the website will appear in the chat. But uh, Jan, could you could you briefly explain what the upcoming seminar will be about? Yeah, the upcoming seminar will be about uh, kind of uh, bottom-up self-assembly to create life or synthetic life. I guess George has been talking about how to take life and go more, say, in advanced uh, kind of biotechnology. I think uh, Professor George also has nicely shown how you can go to via reverse engineering to the minimal cells. But there's also a development going on more directed by molecular scientists who want to create using systems chemistry approaches and supermolecular chemistry approaches. Uh, assemblies of molecules that are more and more reminiscent of, of, of living systems that have more more lifelike features. And that's a field that we'd like to discuss with uh, Sibren Otto, uh, professor of uh, Groningen, expert in the field of uh, Darwinian evolution of molecular systems and systems chemistry approach. And also will kind of give an introductory talk in the effect of compartmentalization in creating lifelike systems. And hopefully people will join us in discussing also uh, the, the benefits and the possibilities of that development in yeah. science. Okay, perfect. And is it open for uh, only for researchers or also for students? It's open for everyone who feels this field is of interest. So we are open to anyone who wants to join. Sure. Okay, that's great. Um, well, this was the last uh, Studium Generale program uh, of this academic year. I uh, hope to see you in September uh, after our summer break and hopefully uh, on campus again. Um, so check our website and socials to see what's uh, coming up in the next academic year. Um, good luck with your exams and also with research projects and everything else. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, George, thank you for being us today. And I see he has left the <laughs> online virtual room. So thank you, everyone, and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.